Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian lad and today I watched a What If episode 5 at 0.25x speed and found some amazing details that will blow your mind. But please be aware, I'm gonna go scene by scene and not just talk about details or easter eggs. I'm essentially gonna explain the whole episode. So without any further ado, let's begin. Today's episode opens with Hulk getting transported back to Earth. So we're picking up just before the events of Infinity War. In the main timeline, we already saw how things panned out. But in this universe, things got even worse. When Bruce Banner got back to Earth, this wasn't the planet he was expecting. It all started with Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne. Now we know from the MCU that Janet Van Dyne went subatomic and entered the quantum realm in 1987. She stayed gone for 30 years. But in this universe, while she was there for 30 years, she contracted a quantum virus that essentially turned her into a zombie. So when Hank Pym went to rescue her, she transmitted the virus to him. And when they both came back from the quantum realm, they transmitted it to Scott Lang. And within a matter of days, the entire New York, including the Avengers, were all turned into zombies. So so this is what Bruce Banner came back to, as opposed to a broken Avengers in the main timeline. The main timeline now doesn't seem that bad, does it? We get the same camera angles and shots when Bruce Banner crash lands into the Sanctum. He warns that Thanos is coming, but finds no one to talk to, except the Cloak of Levitation. Notice it moves ever so slightly, giving us a hint it's still very much alive, which will in fact play a significant role in this episode. More about it when I get to that bit. Bruce then puts on one of the Sorcerer's uniforms. Now the Sorcerer's did have a purple outfit, but I can't help but think just how purple Perfect this color looks on Bruce Banner, considering Hulk always used to wear purple pants in the comics. He then sees that Bleecker Street is quite literally abandoned. We then come across Ebony Maw and Call Obsidian. And of course, Bruce Banner fails to Hulk out. Well, uh, because of continuity. Now, I found something interesting here. Notice how the exact moment Ebony Maw says you're about to die at the hands of the children of Thanos, just when he says hands, that is exactly when Tony's hand appears from a portal behind him. I'll play it for you so you understand it better. You are about to die at the hands of the children. Children of we then see Wong, Tony Stark, and Doctor Strange walk out of the portal with the Avengers background score. This looked really similar to how T'Challa walked out of a portal at the end of Endgame. Even though Bruce didn't realize they're actually zombified Iron Man and Doctor Strange, but if you notice very carefully, you could already tell this isn't the same Tony Stark. Now seeing them walking out of the portal, Bruce says this. Oh boy, are you guys screwed! Which is a callback to this scene where Thor made the greatest superhero entrance. <laughs> The tribe then made such good use of their powers and utilized the portals as much as they could. Now you may ask, why didn't the Avengers use the portals as much in Infinity War? Well, the answer is simple. The Avengers were trying to beat Ebony Maw and Call Obsidian, whereas the zombified Avengers are basically trying to eat them. And you can't eat someone if you're standing 50 miles away from them. So the first move they chose to make was to open a portal and get near them. Now Bruce slowly realizes Tony, Wong, and Steven are acting a bit too brutal, because Bruce actually noticed how Wong had literally jumped and groped Ebony Maw. Something you don't often see in a normal fight. Then it is officially revealed to us that they're all zombies, and Tony Stark prepares to blast Bruce Banner, but the Cloak of Levitation comes to his rescue. Wong then tries to eat Bruce, but gets stopped by the cape. So not all heroes wear a cape, some are just cape itself. And I again love the way they executed this scene. The cape is holding Doctor Strange on one hand while stopping Wong on the other, while in the background Tony Stark was literally lying on top of Cull Obsidian. Now notice how none of them lost their powers and abilities even after getting infected with the virus. So the virus doesn't take away any of their powers. Wong then gets beheaded by his own portal, something we've seen already in Infinity War. But of course, the scenario was a bit different. But what remained consistent though is the fact that Bruce will always kick the remains if someone got chopped through a portal. Enters Hope Van Dyne who uses thousands of ants and completely decimates Doctor Strange, Ebony Maw, and Call Obsidian. However, Tony survives thanks to his nano suit. So as a last resort, Hope had to decapitate Tony Stark. So pretty brutal scenes within the first five minutes of the episode. Spider-Man arrives who is not voiced by Josh Keaton as many believed he would. Instead, it was played by Hudson Thames, who I think has done a remarkable job. And in some scenes, I didn't even feel it wasn't Tom Holland. You notice, even though Spider-Man is wearing his mask in this scene, but this is the only time we see him in his mask. Because in this universe, there's no one left alive who doesn't know his true identity. The Watcher then explains how the virus started evolving, which I've told you already. But I never thought I'd get to hear the Watcher say this. <laughs> Oof. The Watcher expressing his feelings so vividly is just planting the seeds for future episodes where the Watcher will in fact intervene. Peter then shows Bruce a tutorial that he made to escape a zombie attack. Now in this tutorial, we see Happy Hogan wearing a t-shirt that says, I'm not single, I'm saving myself for Thor, and also an Iron Man repulsor glove on his hand. Now his skills include driving and boxing, which is another continuity detail from the Iron Man films, where we've seen him as both Tony's chauffeur and was helping Tony train boxing. This is also a nod to the comics, where Happy Hogan is 
actually a boxer. Then we meet Kurt, a very funny and a significant character from the Ant-Man franchise. Now notice he's wearing the same ex-con jacket that we've seen him wear in Ant-Man and the Wasp. Now this ex-con basically stands for ex-convicts, which they all were in the main timeline. His skills include Slavic folklore, probably because he keeps bringing Baba Yaga all the time, and crime because, uh, well, he was a convict already. And I like how Kurt uses a packet of ketchup as an improv blood. Next we see Bucky Burns, who gets introduced as silent but deadly. Notice how his shower curtain is adorned with red, white, and blue stars and stripes. This is a nod to his patriotic side and his association with Captain America. His skills are murder, a killer arm, and heavy sleeper. But if I just rewind back a few seconds, notice how Peter's cell phone is almost dying. This is an animated show for God's sake, but Marvel still made sure to add such little details like this. Up next, we see Sharon Carter, who in our timeline is now the power broker. Then we meet Okoye, who came here to find her king T'Challa. Notice how the Cloak of Levitation was also watching the homemade tutorial made by Peter Parker. We then learn they made their base with a series of buses suspended over the city. Now even though this does seem like one of the greatest ways to escape a zombie apocalypse, but zombies who can fly, for instance Iron Man or the Wizards, could very easily make it here. So the fact that this base isn't shattered or affected indicates they made this base after Iron Man died. And notice all of these buses are held together with Peter's web. And we learned in Spider-Man Homecoming that his web takes two hours to dissolve. Hey, that's gonna dissolve in two hours! So maybe in this universe, Peter's webs are a bit stronger and doesn't dissolve as quickly. Therefore, he was able to make this base. Or maybe he makes a new base every two hours. <laughs> The Avengers then find out a potential cure to this virus, which is located in Camp Lehigh. Now, Camp Lehigh is of course the birthplace of Captain America, where Steve Rogers trained at and became the man he was. They then all travel to New Jersey, but during that, we're made to believe that a giant-sized zombie is attacking them, only to realize that this zombie isn't that big, but they're the one traveling in miniature mode. Now, this scene was foreshadowing the arrival of the undead giant wasp. More about it when I get to that. I like how there are two buttons on the van, a big one to become big and a small one to activate miniature mode. And notice when the van was small, the front was completely okay, but as soon as it comes back to its normal size and shatters the zombie into pieces, the front grill takes a huge dent because of colliding with the zombie. Another great attention to detail. Okoye then decides to split the group into two, which Peter thinks is not a good idea. Splitting up in a zombie apocalypse is the last thing you should do. Her lack of sensibility here shows why she's in need of T'Challa. We then get to see Sam Wilson, aka Falcon, who is also infected with the virus. And Happy over here gets huddled with all these birds. Now in the comics, Falcon can actually communicate with birds through his telepathic ability, and it seems as though Falcon did just that to distract Happy. Now each time Happy shoots using his repulsor gauntlet, he says blam. Sharon takes notice of this as well. Were you saying blam? Was I? Now a big fight takes place where Happy gets infected as well. And notice even when Happy became a zombie, he was still saying blam. <laughs> Now over here, Peter is trying to jumpstart the train by creating enough thrust and momentum, but he was about to be eaten by one of the undead. But luckily, the Cloak of Levitation again comes to rescue, and Okoye over here literally cuts Falcon in half. But just like Bucky, we should have been sat here, but we are not. Now the train finally starts running, and they're on their way to Camp Lehigh. We then see Peter Parker effortlessly donning the Cloak of Levitation. He asks Hope if she thinks he can pull it off, and this is what she says. Maybe I'll grow into it. You will grow into it. Hmm, does it ring any bells? Well, in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Miles Morales asks Stan Lee if he can return the mask if it doesn't fit. But Stan Lee said there's no need to return it, as he will eventually grow into it. I immediately thought of Stan Lee when Hope said that to Peter. Cut to Sharon who gets attacked by a zombified Captain America. Now, out of all these entrances, Cap's entrance was the most intense is what I felt. Even though we already knew what's coming through the promos, but I still enjoyed this scene as if I watched it for the first time. This slow reveal from darkness to light also resembles his entrance in Infinity War. Now I noticed something really creepy over here. When Sharon got bitten by Cap and was lying unconscious on the floor, notice one of her fingers was twitching ever so slightly, again establishing the fact that she isn't dead. She has just been infected with a virus. Now there's one more detail in this scene that I can guarantee you nobody will notice except if you watch it in slow motion. Notice whenever Bucky punches Cap's shield using his metal arm, it surges some sort of an energy, which makes sense because colliding two vibranium metals are creating a friction here, therefore this fiery effect. However, when Bucky Bucky punches Cap's shield using his normal hand or the right hand, there's no more friction, cause the shield is not absorbing as much energy here as it does when it gets hit by the metal arm. This scene lasted like 2 seconds in real time, but the VFX team still made sure to pay attention to this detail. Bucky then finishes the fight by decapitating Cap. Guess this is the end of the line. 
this is of course a callback to their famous line from Captain America the Winter Soldier. Hope then flies into Sharon's mouth and bursts her open from the inside. I'm so glad Marvel is basically turning all of her endgame theories into realities through this show. But if you think about it, penetrating someone's body and then bursting them open from the inside is just too brutal to show in live action if you want to retain the PG rating. To notice, even the Hope was in her suit while she executed this horrible murder, but when she takes off her helmet, there were pieces of Sharon on her face and hair as well. This was foreshadowing the scratch which basically infected her with this virus. Now Hope's health was quickly getting worse, but Peter tells her to keep Hope. So Hope asks Peter how does he do it? How does he remain so upbeat and happy? In practice, I guess. My mom, dad, Uncle Ben, Mr. Stark, I've lost a lot. This is the first time ever in the MCU that we've got a direct name drop of Uncle Ben. The best we got previously was the initials on a briefcase in Spider-Man Far From Home. Now when Peter was saying he lost a lot in his life, his parents, Uncle Ben, but as soon as he says Tony Stark, who used to be his mentor, notice it affects Bruce Banner in the background as well. My mom, dad, Uncle Ben, Mr. Stark. Because he used to be good friends with Tony, the two geniuses. So when Peter mentioned Tony's name, it had an emotional impact on Bruce as well. We then learned that the train's fuel is almost up, and they have to go through the thousands of undead in order to make it to the camp. Hope decides to sacrifice herself, which will enable the rest of the team to reach the camp. Hope says she's to be blamed for all of this, as she's the one who brought back her mother, inadvertently the virus as well. She becomes extremely big and helps the team cross this horde of zombies. Bucky then realizes even though they're inside the camp, but for some reason the undead are not invading it. In fact, the fence is even broken in one part, and they're still not walking in. We then learn that they're not attacking because of the Mind Stone that emits us a frequency which is not to their liking. So of course we meet Vision who has successfully found a cure through the Mind Stone, and his first test subject was Scott Lang. Now Scott is a head in a jar, which is taken straight from the comics, where it was actually Janet who was beheaded and became an ally of Black Panther. Scott makes a few jokes here, which I'll be honest worked pretty good, and I wouldn't be surprised if we come to know that this was all Paul Rudd who came up with his jokes. Now they need access to a satellite so they can transmit the frequency from the Mind Stone to the entire world, which potentially could cure this disease. Vision says such technology doesn't exist, but Okoye says in Wakanda it does. And notice in the computer screens behind Vision, everything was in the same color except this frequency which is red. Now Vision is purple and the Mind Stone is yellow, so why is this frequency on the screen red? This was foreshadowing the arrival of Scarlet Witch, who uses chaos magic which is red. Bucky then goes to look for a transport in the base, as they will need one to travel to Wakanda, but Vision asks acts weird and says there's no need to do it. Bucky then learns the truth about this vision, who has been feeding humans to his zombie girlfriend Wanda. So whichever Avengers or heroes came here before, Vision has been feeding them to Wanda. Well, in Vision's defense, I've got nothing. Peter asks Vision why he didn't fix Wanda like Scott. Vision says Wanda is too powerful and resisted the cure. So Okoye asks why didn't you just kill her instead of submitting to her? And Vision simply says he couldn't. So this is a reversal of what we've seen in WandaVision. In this one, Vision is the one killing innocent people in order to sustain the love of his life. We find T'Challa with one of his legs cut off. Vision was saving T'Challa to eventually feed him to Wanda, which is also directly taken from the comics. The Scarlet Witch then awakens, and we enter the final of this episode. Vision realizing his mistake decides to help the heroes. But ironically, Scott became the chosen one and as he flew away, he says this. Wingardium Leviosa! Wingardium Leviosa is a levitation spell from Harry Potter. So is Harry Potter no canon to the MCU? Anyway, Vision then sacrifices himself and turns grey as soon as he takes out the stone off of his head. Um, remind me how many times he has died in the MCU so far? My goodness, he's like the punching bag of the MCU now. Anything happens, he has to die. It's like his absolute point. Now as soon as the Mind Stone gets separated from Vision's consciousness, the undead began to storm the camp. You notice this particular zombie is carrying not one but two katanas, and also wearing a red suit. Could this be Marvel's clever way of introducing us to Deadpool? Or maybe I'm just reaching here, let me know your thoughts. Now to give the team a little bit more time to escape, Bucky decides to put his life on the line. You notice even a zombified version of Scarlet Witch was devastated at the death of Vision. She didn't even eat Bucky, just simply threw him away. This was a powerful scene, showing the depth of their love no matter what version of them we are seeing. Scarlet Witch eventually tries to bite Bruce, but thanks to Hulk who came enough to prevent any penetration. Ah, uh, that doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. Bruce then hulks out completely and sacrifices himself to bite the team a little bit more time. We get an epic fight between Hulk and the Scarlet Witch as Peter Scott and T'Challa take off. They come across the zombified gigantic Hope, who couldn't really pose a huge threat at the end. We get one more callback to Endgame with this funny exchange between Scott and Peter. Last year, Mr. Stark asked me to join the Avengers, and, and now they're all gone. Plus, they're not all gone. I'm so sorry, I, I forgot. You are an Avenger. Do you want to grab one with me? 
I'm Ant-Man. Then we learn that Thanos has already invaded Wakanda and is also infected with the zombie virus. He has already acquired all the Infinity Stones except the Mind Stone, which is on its way in this ship. And that's how this episode ends. This cliffhangers might get a bit frustrating at times, but I think it was necessary for the story that Marvel wanted to tell. And that's it. This would be my breakdown of What If Episode 5 at 0.25x speed. I hope I managed to give you lads a few new details you didn't catch before. If I did, then please give me a thumbs up, grab the subscribe button and turn notifications on. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter where I'm getting more active every passing day. See you lads in the next one.